Welcome to episode 10 of a D5 Football Podcast. This week we're joined by Alex Whitmore of AFC Filed. How are you doing, mate? Not too bad, mate. How are you? I'm good as well. Uh, so obviously episode 10 we're now on to, so double figures. I don't think we get to uh, episode 10, like we are just saying before, and so quite good. Um, before we start, obviously, uh, we've got lots of uh, other other episodes we've done, in, so you can go and have a look at it in the description if you're watching uh, after this one. Um, first thing, as we always say, um, how did you get into football? Um, I think probably like most of the lads you've had on before, um, started playing at a, a very, very young age, as we all do, love the game, just especially when you're younger, you want to play as, as long as you can. Mm. Um, always played Sunday League, really, um, obviously played school football, county football, things like that. Um, I was never one of the ones that got into an academy at a young age and came through the academy. I um, played Sunday League till I was 16, uh, until I was fortunate enough to, to get um, a scholarship with Burnley so yeah played uh, played back home played local for probably best part of 10 years um, before I ever made it anywhere near the what it costs as a professional game So you spoke about uh, it said Burnley there um, growing up then what, what was sort of the point where you sort of realised okay um, I'm actually sort of quite good at this so you know better than average if you like and there might be might be something in it Um, so fun. I mean I played for a couple. I mean, if anybody's familiar with North East football, they'll know of Wars and Boys Club. I um I played for Wars and Boys Club for six years from under 11s to under 16s, which is the entirety of the 11 aside sort of age group, I'd say. Um, and and I hadn't really thought about it, you know till probably under 16s at least. I you know I had a couple of trials um, as everyone does at that age. You trial here, there, and everywhere. Um, you know, I spent time at Sunderland, Stoke, uh, Chef Wired, Hull, a um, couple of places. And then uh, I, um, it was probably, yeah, so it was, you, you're looking at the back end of the under 16 season. I think I got offered my scholarship in April uh, of 2012. So it was right at the end of the season. So probably just at the time where I was looking at thinking, do I need to be going on to sixth form here or am I going into college? What am I going to do like from sort of 16 to 18 really? Um, and like I say, fortunately enough, it came through, got the offer through on me, uh, on my dad's 50th birthday. So that was uh, a nice little surprise for him. Obviously I'd come out in uh, Sunday league. So I was raw, didn't really understand what the pro game was about, what was required, um, you know, how to, to conduct myself really. It, it was all totally sort of new to me. Um, so, you know, I was, <sighs> I'd never experienced anything like it before, meeting, you know, a group of lads that you've never seen before. I've always just played with lads that I knew from school, county, things like that. So it was, it was very, moving away from home as well was a big step at 16. Um, So it was very, very different, very strange. Um, But no sort of hiding places, really. You just had to, you had to get on with it. Um, You know, as as a lot of lads will probably tell you, especially the older ones and things like that now, it's, it's part and parcel of, of growing up and, what I'd say is becoming a man, really, you know, moving away from home, you've got no, no comforts, like I say, I said before, no hiding places, you, you either have to, to buy into it or, or not, and, you know, I think I managed to do that over the two years, specifically from 16 to 18, um, you know, I, sort of back, even back then, we're only talking, well, we're talking nearly 10 years ago now, really, um, it wasn't, as you see now, with the 17s, the 18s, the 21s, the 23s, the, you know, and then the first team, it was just the 18s, the resis and the first team. So you either played for the youth team, you played for the dev squad or you played for the first team. That was it even even only sort of 10 years ago now. So, you know, it's only recently that we're seeing those changes where there's sort of five or six teams at youth level. Mm. Do you think um, if, if they, those sort of, you know, like I said, five or six teams at youth level were around, you know, uh, when you were that age, do you think that would have been beneficial to you or do you think it could have absolutely uh, hindered you? What do you think could have happened? Um, I suppose I would imagine now there's probably a massive sort of confidence play in there. I mean, if you're, for example, 18, playing in the 18s, you know, when you want to be playing in the 21s and the 23s, there's probably a sign there, you know, that either you're not ready yet or it's going to be a couple of years. You know, if you're 17 and you're playing in the 23s, that would give you an inkling that the club sees you and, you know, puts you in a sort of higher stead 
Um, so that could play on your mind a little bit. Um, but it's hard. I think when you're that age, it's 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 individual performance really. What regardless of what level you're at, if you're 17 and you're performing in the 17s, then you're absolutely fine. If you're 18 and you're performing in the 18s, then you're fine. If you're 23 and you're not performing, then that's when you'd probably start to fret and think, right, there's an issue here. I might have to be. I might potentially be looking at dropping down to the lower leagues. Um, but again, at that age, you, I wouldn't read too much into it. It's a case of you're playing games, you're still learning your trade. At the end of the day, you're still only 18, 19, 20, whatever it is. It's still ridiculously young in the game of football. So, you know, it, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it's too big an issue. And you also mentioned a little bit before um, moving away from home. I think we've had a few of the guys in here who uh, perhaps a little bit uh, later on moved away from home, um, you know, sometimes to the other side of the country for, for football. Is that something you think um, helped you sort of um, perhaps get away from some, you know, you, like you said, the comfort stuff, like, away from your mates, away from things that might sort of distracted you because there is that, you know, the normal, like, you know, like it's perhaps something like at school, you, you know, you could be is it, relatively important things there that you should be doing, um, you know, like for everyone else and it, they can distract you. So to get away, to, you know, to with a group of lads who all have the same goal, there's not really going to be any distractions. Is that something that helps you or, um, you know, moving I away? Think so. I think so. I think, um, I, I do think it's a massive sort of growth step really in, in anybody's career who's ever had to move away from home. Like you say, you move away from your mates, you move away from your mum and dad. I mean, fortunately for me, I was two and a half hours down the road. You know, they came to nearly every game. Um, I was home most weekends. You know, I get home on a Saturday night. But that Diggs lifestyle is totally different. I mean, th there's rules. You've got to be in the house by a certain time. You've got to be at training a certain time. You know, you fin You know, it's not a case if you've got a load of free time anywhere to do things, especially at that age. You're in at half eight. You look if you see five o'clock most days before eighteen. So, it it was good in that there was no distractions. You know, by the time you were finished, you were knackered anyway, so you won't be mm -hmm. doing anything. Um, but you know, I think as you as you get slightly older, as you get towards your your first year pros and things like that, your nineteens, twenties, twenty ones, twenty twos, when you know you might have a house with the lads, it, it's a bit different. Um, but I, th I think moving away from home is one of the biggest things you could do as a, as a young footballer. Like you say, it does teach you to grow up. You've got to cope by yourself. You've got to live on somebody else's terms with little to no money, by the way. At 16 to 18, you're on apprenticeship wage. Like It's not like you're out spending left, right and centre. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think, and if I remember rightly, the lads that lived at home during my time there didn't, didn't go on to get the second, third year's pros. Not saying that there's a correlation there. There might be, I don't know. I don't know the science behind it, but I think the lads that sort of moved away and had to grow up very quickly in order to, deal, to, to, to handle themselves tend to do better further down the line. Mm. And talking about moving further down the line, you then uh, got a long spell at Chester. Now, it was quite short-lived. We've got five appearances here, quite short-lived. But getting that move, well, first of all, how did it, sort of come about and when do you sort of get the phone call okay that Chester want you? Um, I mean I was probably getting to that age I think I was 20 at the time um, I was getting to that age where I needed to be looking at, at playing proper football um, and I think it happened at the time I was just I think it was a day off actually I was just sort of sat in the house um, I got a phone call from the 23's manager at the time Michael Jolly um, he said uh, I'm trying to sort a loan deal for you to, to Chester um, which was conference obviously coming to Prem at the time. Um, you know, I hadn't had it, I hadn't, exp hadn't had anybody come in for me before. I hadn't had any interest before really. So it was new to me. I was dead excited. I thought brilliant, happy days. Um, but I think that was a Monday. I can't remember if it was a Monday afternoon or a Tuesday morning that I got the text. And I remember getting a phone call saying, you need to get yourself down to turf and whatnot to, to sign the forms. I lived sort of 20 minutes away, so it was no issue. Drove in, signed the forms. I remember signing the forms at sort of midday on a Tuesday. Uh, went home. I was getting myself ready. I got a phone call saying, we've missed one of the sheets. You need to come back. So I drove back to Turf Moor again, middle of the afternoon. Signed the last form, by which time it was set, time ready to set off for the game. 
to drive straight to Chester to start the game on a Tuesday night. Mm. So my first ever senior appearance in football, I'd signed basically at three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon and I was in the starting 11 at quarter to eight on a Tuesday night. So it was a sort of baptism, baptism of fire, throwing at the deep end as you sort of speak. Um, and that was it. Drew the game 1-1 against Dover, who were, who were flying quite high at the time. Um, and that was it. That was that was my official start in, in senior football. Like I say, five hours notice, straight in at the deep end. Mm. And one of the things, I think one of the clips we are speaking about, you know, doing my research, found you scored a bit of an, an own goal against Gateshead in, in sort of, I think, the uh, end of the game. Is it an own goal or deflection? What are you calling it? It was it was a deflection. It was one of them. It got it got smashed right back across the box. Didn't see it. It just sort of hit me and went in. You know, it, it, I remember being absolutely gutted at the time because we played well, uh, deserved something from the game. Um, you know, it, so it, it it was a heartbreak sort of thing, really. Um, but it's going to happen at some point in your career, and I suppose happening, you know, sort of two or three games into your career, then it sort of prepares you for any sort of mistakes happening later on. Um, so it wasn't the worst thing. Um, obviously gutted at such a young age to pretend that was the first time I'd ever experienced sort of costing somebody mm. like three points that really mattered. People talk about going on loan to, to the conference and playing for, playing for three points. That's the difference between men's football and the 23s when it, and it really matters when somebody's mortgage is on the line or, you know, people are losing money and things like that based on points. So it mattered and it hurt. Um, but it's somebody, everybody's going to go through it at some point in their career probably rather it happened early than, than later on. So you've got that experience and you're better for it. So in the grand scheme of things, not the worst thing in the world, but yeah, good. <laughs> good to be doing that so early in my career, yeah. Like I said, it was a short spell, but you did get, I think, at least down here, is one win against Torquay, a 4-1 win. All the others were, you know, like I said, draw against Dover or, or, or defeats. Um, in that short spell, I guess really the you know, you've got that one win. Normally for strikers, it's sort of, oh, I want to score one goal and you know, score one goal, that'd be fine. For def- defender, I guess, really, there's not really much else, but to just get one win, and you don't know what's going to ha- come after that, perhaps. You know, it could have really been that that loan spell ends, you go back to under 23s, and then you never make it back to that level ever again. We see that with some players. We're just happy to sort of say, you know, even if it did end here, and it, it, obviously it didn't end because we're speaking now, were you thinking even if it did end here and I never got to play at this level again, I'm happy that I've done it. Is that what you were thinking? Absolutely. Um, like I say, so we're looking at 2015 there, I think that was. Mm. Um, to make a senior appearance, like coming out of Sunday League, through the youth teams, things like that, was a massive thing. Like, and I, th- I still think today it is. I, 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 think, I think today it's easier to get an appearance now than what it was back then and, the, and years before that, I think. It, it was difficult because there had to be a big level of trust there between a player and a manager. So to make a senior appearance at commerce level was, like I say, nothing. I'd, I'd never thought I'd get there, you know, like I say, Sunday league and things like that. It, it, you know, it's still essentially non-league and things and people might look at it and look down on it and things like that. You've got to be a good player to play in the conference. Like, there's no hiding from that. It's, you know, there's lads now that... Well, I, I, I've played with lads that haven't played at that level that should easily have played at that level. It just hasn't happened for them. That's how easy it is for it to not happen, if you get what I'm saying. It's a big deal. Um, and, and then it was, like you say, at 20 to be playing in the conference. Uh, you almost class that as the start of your career. It's your first appearance or first handful of appearances. Then you start looking up the ladder. But, you know, you don't just waltz into a League 2 or a League 1 or a Championship team nowadays. It just doesn't happen. Like, you've got to put those blocks in place. And I think that was what I saw was the first little step um, on the ladder towards a senior career, really. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a big deal. I was buzzing. Um, you know, I've still got my shirt from my debut. Um, I've got all my shirts from every team I've ever played for, really. But it was, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a proud moment. Um, something I didn't see happening. Like you say, getting towards the later stages of 16. So, no, uh, it, I was over the moon. And uh, once you get that taste, that's when it starts. That first game, I think that's when you really get the hunger for the game. And then um, you got moved to Gateshead, obviously up up near northeast, obviously where you're from. When did you realise 
when when you know getting the phone calls, text messages that that, that Gates had been for you? Um, my agent at the time gave me a phone call actually and said that they were interested. And then uh, it was Neil Aspin. Uh, he gave me a phone call saying we'd love to get you up here. Um, it wasn't something that I ever thought of would ever happen where I'd, I'd get a move to a club back home. Um, didn't think it was going to happen. It was it's it's a one in a million that you ever get to play for what you class as a as a hometown club really. Um, but yeah, they rang me. I, I was I was getting up at six o'clock in the morning, driving at three hours to Chester, three like an hour and a half back on next to no money as a as a first year pro. It 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 wasn't easy. I loved loved being there. I loved playing games. Everything about it was brilliant. But it, it was like I say, the travelling three three. I think it was Monday, Tuesday, Thursday we trained getting up at six o'clock. Sometimes I wouldn't even make it to training because the travelling coming down that M6 and things like that, it was, was shocking. Like, I don't know whether it was just that time of year, that particular year, I don't know. But for whatever reason, I think in a month, I think it was like four times where I didn't even get to training because it was just that bad. And I thought, I can't do this for the rest of the year. Like, I need I need a change. So, yeah, jumped in. Um, Aspen rang me got me up there. Uh, I think it was New Year's Eve or New Year's Day I went up there. Uh, and that was it. Moved back home, back home with my parents. 15 minutes away from home to the training ground. Um, totally different sort of routine. Um, you know, that was full time. That was Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, mainly. Um, you know, so loved it. Loved playing for Gateshead. A um, lot of good people there. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed my, my six months there. I was fortunate enough to play pretty much every game. So uh, it was a very sort of beneficial uh, loan leave, I'd call it. And the sort of general uh, position wise between Chester and, and Gateshead, I think the numbers say Chester were sort of lower mid table and Gateshead uh, throughout that season were uh, not in the playoffs, uh, but up there and, and just outside of it and eventually sort of finished. You know, just outside of them. Um, what was that like then? The, the sort of difference between low mid table and sort of move, moving up the table and sort of promises. Yeah. Obviously, didn't end up being playoffs, but promises of playoffs. Yeah, I mean, we had chances. Um, we we could have finished the season a lot stronger than what we did. We had a good side, a lot of good lads um, who I'm still in touch with now. Um, you know, we we had a good chance to, to do something really. We just we just didn't put it together, and I think as it got towards March and April, it just sort of, the season sort of petered out. You know, we were never going to go down into the bottom half or to you know be struggling. Um, but it just started to look like we weren't going to quite make the playoffs. And um, I think Chester actually beat us four one on the last game of the season, so you know that was a, a nice return. Um, but I wouldn't say a massive difference. I preferred being there four days a week rather than sort of three. Um, like I say, the facilities were, were slightly better. We had access to a, a gym. We had um, grass pitches. We had obviously this gate. I don't know if you've ever been or know Gates of Stadiums, a phenomenal facility. Mm. Um, it was it was thoroughly enjoyable. Um, and like I say, being so close to home was was a nice treat as well, really. Um, it, I probably enjoyed the second half of that season more than I did the, the month at Chester, so to speak, but not for playing terms. I loved playing games. I was still young. It, the rest of it didn't really matter. It was the games that, that were important. Um, but yeah, it, like two different sort of routines, different lifestyles. Um, so yeah, all sort of good learning experiences, really. Yeah. And you sort of mentioned it there, that the stadium of Gateshead. Now I've actually been up there for an FA Cup away game a few years ago and it is a bit um, I think it has changed uh, I think they had added a roof of, um, a few years ago um, since you, you were there I think he had added a roof but it was one of those like such a strange stadium because it's like it's a bit, I think it's a bit like um, similar if I remember correct I think I've got the right team similar to Bradford Park Avenue Stadium I think it's got like the running track around it and it's a bit like you know some of the stadiums you got on FIFA or some of the foreign stadiums you get where you've got this massive gap between the pitch. And obviously the stadium is, you know, and I could say this, and I don't think I'm, you know, saying anything too wrong, the stadium is a little bit too big for where the team is now in terms of attendances, where it's this big stadium, you could fit, was it, 10,000 people in, and the, the actual attendance isn't in, in as big as that. So it's a little bit strange in there that you sort of like such a big stadium yet, and 
is a little bit worse as well because there's a ma- massive gap between you and the fans. So does does that make it a bit? Would that make it a bit awkward then to celebrate and, and you know being involved with the fans if there's a massive sort of running track between them? Yeah, I think it's uh, lad, lads know what gate is like. It's it's weird being sort of pushed out there in the middle of everything. It's almost like sort of like the Coliseum, like you're you're in the middle, mm. everybody else is miles away, sort of looking down. It's a bit it's a bit daunting. Um, the wind picks up in there because it's so open. Um, and not, not an easy place to go to. Um, probably prefer to be a home side there, really, rather than an away side. Um, yeah, it's a shame about the attendances. Um, you know, we were fortunate to have a, a couple of big games. We played Grimsby at home. Uh, managed to beat them 1-0. You know, there was a good turn out there. Um, but again, as the season sort of died out, the, the attendances died out. But again, you've got, you've got Newcastle five minutes up the road. You've got Sunderland 10 minutes down the road. You've got Middlesbrough, Hartlepool, all teams that are, you know, big teams with big fan bases that have access to, to higher level football. Um, it's unfortunate you'd like to see more support in the non-league teams. And I, I love Gator to bit with my app, like, will always have a place in my heart. Um, you know, it's sad that they don't get the attention, especially now, you know, can't speak to now, you know, the current situation we're all in. But you'd like to see more fans there and fill that stadium. Um, as best they can, really, like you say, to 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 close it off a little bit. Like you say, mm. it's open. It's it's not it's not well. Like you say, as an away team, it's not a nice place to go. Um, Gates still have a good side now as well. We played them earlier in the season this year. They're a very good side. Um, you know, so like you say, it, it would be nice to fill it up. Um, it's a shame, really. You, you could imagine the architecture of it. If it was slightly more enclosed, it would feel. A lot more atmospheric, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, maybe I don't know. Maybe it's one day that they can do something about it. But it's home to massive athletics tournaments and things like that. So I don't see it changing in the near future. Coming to the end of you, spell it, Gate said then. What were you thinking in terms of then the season after that? Were, were there any sort of hints or rumours from, you know, from Burnley or from Gate said about you know what might be happening uh, in next season after that? Um, I spoke to the chairman at Gateshead um, about staying on permanently. Um, I was still 21 at the time, but I'd been offered a new contract by Burnley, so a no-brainer really at the time I was always going to stay. Um, but I hadn't had any thoughts about next year, whether I was going to go up a level, whether I was going to go back to Gateshead, whether I was going to stay in the conference or anything like that. That was all just, it was all just uh, brand new to me. Um, certainly wasn't getting ahead of myself. Um, you know, I, 20 games in the conference you know I mean you've got no reason to be getting big headed or confident or anything like that so it was it was new I um, went back to obviously I went back to Burnley for a, a week or two at the end of the season um, and was told obviously I'd be staying um, and that was it really it was it, you know I'd, I suppose at that age still you don't think too far ahead about where you're going to be next year it's about coming back in pre-season making sure you fit whether that's at 23's level um, or Potentially, you know, you you might get lucky enough to be doing pre-season with the first team. You, you know, the first thing and first and foremost this season is your fitness, whether you've looked after yourself in the summer. So that's that's the most important thing, really. It's not it's not your football. It's whether you can come back in good enough shape to catch somebody's eye. And then you got moved to to Markham, so still sort of um, sort of still up north or anything like. That. And I think, like um, I said, you'll probably say now you probably would have gone back to Berlin then, and it's not too far too far for, from uh, from Burnley Markham so you're still sort of in and around that area and you know traveling or what have you um getting that move then up to obviously league two was that a bit of a shock then league two or were you expecting national league or did you even like get you know other national league offers um it was a bit of a shock really I mean like you say it's not too far away I had a good car school so there was um, a good friend Luke Collin was there um who lived around the corner uh, a good friend Dan Nizic who's back in Australia now uh, and later on, towards the end of the, uh, I think it was August trans deadline day, we signed another young lad from Morecambe as well. So we had four of us that were travelling up. So the travelling wasn't an issue. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was an. I went up sort of on trial really for a week. Um, didn't expect anything. Just went up to to sort of do my best really, see see what come of it. Um, Fortunately enough, they wanted to take me, um, which was massive. Never dreamt of playing in the league. Um, 
you know, it's it's nice. There's a as an on sort of a, a long standing, um, I don't know, sort of achievement really at Warzone Boys Club. The day that you play in the league, you get your name sort of etched into a, a history book really um, of a massive list of players that have have gone on from Warzone Boys Club to play in the league. And I remember getting a, a message saying that you know I'd, I'd eventually made it into that, which was massive because. You know, all the kids growing up, you get the programs on match days and things like that. They're seeing, and my name will forever be there now, which you know makes me happy. I'm still in touch with a lot of people from Wales and Boys Club as well. So, you know, that sort of gave me a, I don't know, uh, a nice memory of my of my time in you know under 16s football. Um, but yeah, League Two football. Um, like I say, never thought I'd be there. It was a, it was a surprise. Certainly, don't think when you're a young lad, you're going to go in and play. You might go in as third choice. Um, but you know, looking back now, I went on to have a, a pretty good season. Um, you know, and well, probably looking back, I've always said it's probably one of my best seasons in football yet. Really, in terms of my performances and what I managed to achieve that year. So the team in general as well. Um, had quite a good start, really, which is a bit strange for, for Markham because they are sort of known of his team who are always down near the bottom, uh, in sort of at least in League Two, just survived. I don't think Markham fans would disagree with that, really, although this season a bit different from them. They had a bit of a good start, and then you had a, a sending off against Doncaster. And I had a look at the clip, and it was a bit, a bit sort of, um, what's, the, what's the word? What would it be the word? Like reckless going in. Was that a yeah. red card, or would you admit that yourself? I think that one was. I think that was actually on my twenty first birthday as well. So I'm gonna forget that one. Um yeah, I think that one was. Um I think we were getting beat four or five one at the time. It it weren't uh it weren't a head loss challenge or anything like that. It was uh I've always been like that. I've always I, I love a good tackle, old fashioned really. Um I went in to to fully win the ball, didn't quite get there, um, you know. But again, learning curve. I remember Jim Bentley speaking to me after the after the game, saying, "You know, that's a learning curve for you. That's three games now you're banned for." I played every game till then, so I was in the team. I was doing well, and anybody will tell you, you know, all it takes is an injury or suspension, and somebody can take your shirt off you for a good period of time. So I was a bit gutted. Um, didn't ever, hadn't ever really ex- like even sort of realised the possibility of, of getting sent off. Um, so to get sent off in a league game was was new to me. Um, you know, and then I was good. So yeah, three games, unfortunately, that was me uh, That was me done for. So uh, all new experiences again, but again, first time I'd experienced it, first couple of months in league football, it's going to happen at some point. Why not happen early? Mm. And you had a bit of a, a spell in the FA Cup well against Coventry and in the EFL Cup, Rotherham and Bournemouth. So again, obviously competition, but the EFL Cup you wouldn't have been involved with in, in National League. Again, another sort of uh, sort of thing that you only get in league football. Um, so being involved with, with that in the EFL Cup and the FA Cup as well, first round. Um, what was that like? Fantastic. Um, I mean, specifically the EFL Cup game, I think Rotherham would beat them 5-4 uh, in extra time, I think. They were a championship at the time. I think it was the, they went down that year, but to beat a championship team as a League 2 team was a bit of a scalp. Um, you know, so a fantastic night there. The FA Cup, we played to Coventry. Um, I think we played Bournemouth, but that might have been in the EFL Cup again. Mm. So that was another. They were, uh, I think they were Premier League at the time. They might be Premier yeah, League or Premier League. Camp. I think. Yeah. Again, like what an experience! Like you're looking at players that played that night. So Nathan Aki, who's now at, like Man City, like just incredible players that you just never imagined playing with or playing against. Um, we weren't we weren't close on the night as well. Um, you know, so fantastic experience. And like the same thing, I'm sat here now talking to you. Like looking back at it thinking what an experience like, I'd love to have that chance again um, maybe as well one day we don't know um, but yeah like I said I was still young 21, 22 at the time not experienced it like just stuff you, you dreamed of as a kid like did you ever think you'd be playing against the Premier League team like probably not mm. so you cherish them you take them and no one can ever take them away from you really so something I'll, I'll sort of hold on to really Team also had a run in the EFL Trophy, and I don't know if that was. I think that might have been the first year that was around. Um, 
and you had, you know, I said a bit of a run it with the group team, group games, whatever, being involved with those games then, what was that like, uh, especially in sort of the revamped format with, with the groups and stuff like that? Excellent. Um, I mean, uh, even now, mate, I'm hopeless with these cup. There's that many different mm. trophies. I, know. I don't know which one was which. Some of the, you know, they've all changed names, changed sponsors yeah. and things like that. I don't know which is which, but, you know, it, it, opportunities to play against teams in the high division, you don't always get that. You know, obviously, you know, so you take them when they come. Um, and like I said, even looking at this year, how often it happens that teams from the lower leagues beat teams from the higher leagues. And that's not anything to do with quality. They're at a higher league because they are better, more consistent players, really, over the grand, like the long term. They are better players. But it comes down to who wants it more on the day. And if you are, like, I mean, you, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Crawley beating Leeds 3 0, like, mm. that, that's not a fluke on the day. Like, it's really not. They wanted it more than Leeds did. That's the way the football is. It happens at any level. Teams from the bottom of even the same league, bottom of the Prem, beating teams at the top, it, it happens. And it is solely down to who wants it more on the day. They're all good players because they're all at the same level. It's, it's not a case of quality. It's mentality and desire really and lads will tell you games when they've not been at it and you know it's the worst thing you can have labelled against you as a player is you don't want it you know lads that have that hunger and that desire in any given game will win that game you can't beat a team that wants it more than you so you know when you do get the chance to go against those better teams you know eventually the quality might might shine through that's the way the game it, it does but to give yourself a chance in those games, it's the desire and the mentality that comes first and foremost. And then for next season, you then got a, a loan move to Bury. So again, another loan move. And you could you can look at that sort of working your way up, really. Loan moves a season in National League 2, loan moves, obviously. Then a loan move in League 2 with, with Markham and then up to League 1. Is that what you were thinking? Thinking you, you're seeing, OK, is this progression? There's some kind of path here of, of what's happening? Absolutely. And, and getting a move to League 1. Yeah, so that's what that's exactly what I thought. Um, I was actually going to go back to Mork. I had obviously interest. I wanted to go back to Morkham for another year. To this day, my biggest regret not going back to Morkham for that second year. I'd had a decent year, um, but that opportunity at League One came in. Couldn't turn it down, really. You know, like you say, natural progression. Can I go and test myself? I had a decent year in League Two. Can I go and test myself at League One? Um, that was the thinking. Um, didn't didn't work out really at Berry. Didn't didn't really get up to much. Not my best spell of football. You know, it it weren't it weren't a great six months really. And um, I say I didn't do myself any justice. Um, you know, which in certain the team in itself didn't didn't get up to much. Um, so yeah, big gutted looking back at that that sort of spell in my career. Um, like I say, I've I've openly said to you know I'm, I work with Jim Bentley again now. Um, that my biggest regret in my career was was not going back for that second year. Um, trying myself too early, maybe he's overconfidence, maybe he's, um, but yeah, didn't, didn't quite work out, but it's part and parcel of the game. You're not always going to get it right. Nobody goes through their career getting everything on, on you know, on the head. So again, like it's fortunate enough to have played a handful of games in League One. Um, it's the highest I've played, you know, I'm, I'm proud of it. Um, but yeah, didn't quite do myself justice. I think if I remember correctly as well that Berry, there was all that talk of them doing quite well that season, about them being up there and they'd made these signings and there was money coming in. Is that something you were aware of? And if, if you were, is that something that perhaps that attracted you more than other offers, Definitely. perhaps Markham, like you said? Definitely. So obviously there was that talk, like you say, um, they'd made a lot of very good signings, some unbelievable players, um, lads that are still playing like very, like. I think majority of that team have gone on to play higher. Um, for whatever reason, we just couldn't make it work. But yeah, and I think that's probably what played, you know, a part in the sort of not not the downfall really. But the team was expected to do very well. They spent a lot of money. They had a lot of good players. Mm. The expectation was was probably promotion really. Um, so you know, when the season didn't start very well, it kind of set the tone for the rest of the year. Um, so yeah, it was it was a massive sort of attraction. But they trained at Carrington, which was you know Man City's old training ground, which was like stunning. Like 
you know, we had all all the best bits, traveling first class on the trains and things like that. It was it was top, top tier stuff. Um, but it just didn't happen on the pitch, um, which happens at times, but at a team that's expected to do so well, that spent so much money, it's um it's not great really. Given that's perhaps and you we could Obviously, you, you were only there for that sort of six months, like you said, and obviously things happened after that, which you, you know, you weren't there for. And, and you know, obviously lots of people have been talking about it, but for what you were for there for those six months and the team, you know, not doing so well that season, what do you think went wrong? Why didn't it click? Because you said everybody knew, yeah, just making these signings, these are some good players. What, why didn't it go right? I don't know. Um, I don't have the answer to this. You see it quite often um, in teams that are expected to do well. Um, never been able to put your finger on it because you narrow it down to sort of individual quality and you say, well, everyone's everyone's a, like a brilliant player. They all deserve to be at that level. Um, sometimes teams just don't gel. Sometimes there's egos, you know, off the field problems, things like that. Um, is it managerial? Is it amongst the players? Is it, I don't know. Um, I still to this day don't, can't quite put my finger on what it was. But I think once once you've taken a few hits, it, you know, if you go a couple, a couple of games without winning and all stuff, it does set the tone and it instills a, you know, a, a lower confidence where you're almost going into a game hoping to win, not expecting to win. So, you know... You you're sort of hanging on and and hoping to nick it rather than taking a game by the scruff of the neck. If you know what I mean, mm. I think going in with that attitude and that mentality automatically puts you you know on a lower peg than than the opposing team. And after so long, teams start to smell blood. They think these are there for the taking. They haven't won in a few. This is a real chance. They come out. They're fired up. They want it probably more than you do. You know. So there's there's all that to factor in. Um, I, I can't quite put my finger on why it didn't work. Um, like you say, the quality was there. It just it just didn't, and it, and it happens, um, unfortunately. So you look at, I don't know, teams in the past that have, that have done it really, you know, sort of Notts County. I'm, I'm looking at sort of lower levels now, but like Notts County, like the quality that they've got in their team, still managed to go down, you know. It, 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 sometimes it just happens. I don't, I don't know... What what's behind it? Is there a, a particular thing? I don't think it's been answered yet. Like I say, there's a saying, too good to go down, but it's just not true. It, you know, you're never too good to go down. You go you go down over the course of 38 or 46 games because you're not good enough over that longevity. Um, and there's no hiding place, like there's no excuses from that. Over 46 games weren't good enough mm. and you can't sort of deny it really. And then you got um, another spell, moved, obviously left Berry, then moved to Chesterfield. So again, that move, again, decision-making, back down to League Two. Um, reasoning for that? Um, I think I was 20, 22 at the time. They expressed an interest on a... I think at the time, Burnley had said, you know, you're, you're not going on, a, on another loan. I was in the last six months of my contract. Um. They'd said either, you know, you, you go on a permanent deal now or um, you stay here, you sign another one year and, you know, you play in the 23s. But I've had that taste now. I wanted league football. Um, I wanted to be playing. I didn't want to be playing 23s anymore. Um, so, you know, it, it came up. I went over and I met the manager, Jack Lester, at the time. Absolute gentleman. Top, top, top guy. Um, still got a lot of respect for him. Um and, and he showed it to me. Um, Sheffield, nice place to live. Uh, lovely stadium. Get a lot of fans. What wasn't to love? Um, they were struggling at the time, sort of bottom of League Two. Didn't really, didn't really phase me. Um, didn't look into it that much, to be honest. It didn't bother me, you know, the league position. Um, I just wanted to be playing football again. So, jumped at it. It was my first permanent move away from Burnley. Um, I've been there for six or seven years now, um, and it was a it was a new start. It was probably, you know, the official start of my senior career. Really, when you know you jump at it with both feet, and you know that's it. You you're back fighting for three p. You haven't got that um, safety net of a parent club to rely on. Like 
the team you're playing for has to win. Um, and I loved it. That was it. So I jumped at it in January. Um, I went from there. So it didn't didn't turn out great, but another experience. I suppose as I've always said, it was you know another experience. You said then the team were down at the bottom, and it's true. You, you know you're looking at the right down at the bottom. And you said it didn't phase you. You weren't, you weren't bothered. Why didn't it bother you? Because normally you look at that. You might you know a player might look at that and sort of think, yeah, I'm not getting involved with that because I don't want the sort of the um, the record to be tarnished of relegation, or they don't want the, sort of the, the what the word to be. Um, Obviously, the pressure, and obviously, if you get relegated, the chance of getting relegated, that's going to knock confidence from you. And really, you know, it's not a nice feeling to be involved in the relegation. Fans don't like it, obviously. So, for players, you know, it's going to be even worse if you sort of feel responsible. Um, why did you decide to then get involved in a relegation scrap compared to perhaps, you know, perhaps sticking out, you said, at the six months at Burnley or, you know, well, uh, somewhere else? The gap wasn't that big at the time. Um, there were some good players there, some very good players. Um, and I looked at it more of a way of I wanted to be somebody that helped get them up, or keep them up, rather than I didn't really, didn't really enter my mind really thinking, oh, I'm going to go there and we're going to go down. Like it, it, it didn't enter my mind. It wasn't, I didn't have that negative sort of feeling. It wasn't like a case of, oh, we might go down. It was, I want to go there and stay up. That was that was my the driving force sort of behind it. One on my debut, which was brilliant. We played really well. Went on, even the few games after that, I don't actually think we got a result for a couple of games, but the performances were, were there and we were close. Like I think we got beat one 0 off Stevenage last couple of minutes. We got beat two one off Crawley last couple of minutes. Um, the performances were there, and it was you know we were there or thereabouts. Um, you know. Then after that, it's a couple of games. You go without a win, and you start to think, right, like now we need a win. Um, but no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't fear the relegation. It's not something I thought of. I didn't think. Oh, I don't. And again, I didn't think I was too good for it. Yeah, they were bottom of the league too. But so what? Like they came and said they were interested in taking me. They wanted me there. Like who am I to say no? Really, I, I wanted to go. Um, like I say, I met Jack Lester, and he sold it to me. I wanted to go and work for him. Um, you know, and, and I, I enjoyed my time there. As, as you know, unfortunate as it turned out, it didn't happen for us. Did end up going down, which was it hurt. It hurt a lot, really. Um, didn't enjoy it. It was probably the lowest I've been in my career. Um, but I've said in the past, in you know, when I've spoken on the issue a couple of times that. I was still young again, as, especially as a centre half at 22. You still classed as as a young player. Um, was I better off experiencing that at a young age and learning how what's required to not be in that situation again, um, or was I better off, you know, getting away with it, getting to 26, 27, 28, and then experience it, having never gone through it before, and it potentially, you know, then in your confidence to, you know, an irreversible effect, really. So, yeah, it hurt. Um, but I was part of the team as well. Um, it wasn't like I was on loan and it didn't matter. I was part of the team and we all went through it. You know, I wasn't palming it off on anybody else. Um, so, yeah, it hurt. Didn't enjoy it. Every bad word and there's something to say about it. But, you know, it... it it's probably going to happen at some point. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It, obviously, it didn't at Berry. Didn't work for me. Didn't work for me at Chesterfield. Um, you know, but you can sit around and cry about it, or you get on with it, um, and that's what I've chose to do with with my career so far. And then you left Chesterfield. Obviously, after six months, after think what was it? You joined on a sort of longer deal, I think, if I remember correctly. So, was that something that you sort of? Worried about if you signed this sort of long deal leaving after six months, was that something you sort of felt a bit bad about, or, or you know, or was it you just sort of thinking, right, well, that's happened now, I'm just going to focus on obviously eventually then John Grimsby? Well, yeah, it, it happened. Um, I was prepared to stay. Um, I'd gone down with the team, I was, I was happy to, to stay with the team. Um, it was a, a funny circumstance behind leaving, um, which wasn't entirely my my doing um but 
the opportunity came up to to get myself back into League Two and to work for a manager I'd worked for before. He was, you know, kind enough to give me the opportunity again. Um, so yeah, we we managed to make it work. Um, and like I say, people, you know, people look at the Premier League and think, oh, he's he signed six months or whatever, or he's leaving, he's moving. Like it's not that simple. I, me and my partner, we moved first time we'd moved from from Burnley to Sheffield. Signed a year's lease on a house. And six months later, you're trying to get out of it. It's you know this is the real world of lower league football. It's not a case of oh we can just pay it off or we're you know we own the house like we had six months left on a on a, a contract that we weren't going to stay in. So we had to we had to go out and find somebody to take our house off us. Otherwise, we were going to get stuck paying for that while trying to move house to somewhere else. And like I say, as much as people think footballers earn great wages, like you're a League Two footballer at the end of the day, like you haven't got the millions that everybody else has to, to fall back on. Like so that put us in a real spot. Um managed managed to get out of it fortunately enough. Um and managed to move up to Grimsby. Um so you know that that's just a you know, a little insight there as to what lower league football's like. It's not as easy as it, you know, that's a that's a real world problem right there. Um you know, so we managed to get out of that, but yeah, got myself up to Grimsby um, for another year in League Two. Um, thoroughly enjoyed that place as well. Good times there. Um, working for a manager that I knew. Uh, actually managed to end up with a lot of good friends from there, um, who I'm still in touch with now. Um, very close friends, actually. Um, so yeah, a, a good year up there. Thoroughly enjoyed it. So just a general, just like I said, good year. And it's sort of another way you didn't, weren't relegation wise, weren't you no know, going down, but also weren't getting up into playoffs or whatever. Um I've then played multiple seasons and like I said, properly getting into senior career. Was that something you were sort of thinking, oh, I just want a you know, promotion, this sort of relegation, this sort of lower league, uh, lower mid table type of thing. Yeah, it's nice it's nice playing games, but you want something like a promotion or just even sort of a sort of a taste of it. Is that something you 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 were looking at? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean that, that was a season of up and downs. That I actually think we had a team to to do very well. We had a lot of good lads. Um, we sort of we sort of win three or four, and then lose three or four, draw a couple, win three or four. It was like you know we never really put a a, a couple of months together. Uh, like I say, we'd get a couple of results, lose a couple, you know, be all doom and gloom, and then win a couple, and and that's why we sort of petered out in the middle of the middle of the table, really. Um, I think we had, I remember looking at it, I think middle of, I don't know, Feb or March or something, and we, we weren't too far off, and, you know, we had a job amongst us, we fancied it between ourselves, like, could we get up there? Um, didn't quite happen, like I say, season ended up petering out, really. Um, but, yeah, a promotion, I mean, I've still, I've still not experienced one yet, I'm still young, you know, I'm hoping to get one soon, but the stories that I hear from lads that have had promotions over the years, it's just phenomenal. Um, I think it's what everybody craves. Um, you know, regardless of what league it is, you are the best team in that league um, or one of the best teams in that league. And I think you want that label, you want that accolade and you want that medal. So, yeah, something that I'm craving. Um, would love to get at some point. Um, but, yeah, again, again no, it's not the be-all and end-all. You know, I played another year at, at league football at a young age, so it was still a massive positive. Also on that game uh, that season so we scored one goal and you know for a sort of defender or whatever you don't generally score many but the goal you scored against was against Notts County and they themselves sort of like what mentioned before are relegation problems and you would have been aware of that how is that you know it's, it gets said like um, you sometimes see you know they've got a relegation team the opposition team have got nothing to play for nothing to lose or whatever that they can perhaps play better play worse or whatever what were you sort of thinking then in that game when you're like, no, you know that you can relegate these guys in this game. What's that like, you know, um, as, as a player for when you've got nothing really to lose, nothing to play for? I think because we were in a situation of we weren't going to go up, we weren't going to go down. Um, we didn't didn't look that much into it. You know, nobody want, I'd experienced the relegation at the time. So I know what the other lads were going through. Um, it's not nice at all. It's, it's horrible. You can, you know, everyone thinks it's just on the pitch. You can actually take it off the pitch quite easily. Um, things start getting affected at home and things like that. It's not nice. It's really not. 
Um, you know, so you, you don't want to sort of kick them when they're down, but at the end of the day, we went there to win the game. Like, that's, that's football, we're competitors, we're professionals. Like, we wanted to go and win the game, regardless of what it did for them. Um, but their backs were against the wall. They had no option other than to win. Um, they won the game. Probably wanted it more than us. It meant more to them than it did to us. Uh, yeah, I was fortunate enough to nick a goal, but it was a consolation. We were never going to go on to win the game. Uh, it was late on. You know, so, you know, fair play to them. It, it gave them a shot in the arm. It gave them a boost. Didn't happen for them. But, yeah, on that day, we, we wanted to win the game. There's no denying it. Like, regardless of what it did for them, whether it put them down, whether it, you know, it, it was irrelevant. Three points was what mattered. Um, and like I say, they, they were the better team on the day. So, that's the way football goes. Now you left Grimsby. And you know um, you've had so you've had these sort of spells, a little bit spell in League One, in League Two, and National League, and getting moved to Fylde. And um, it gets a lot of similar to Berry. It's one of them where Fylde were up there, you know, pre- seasons previously, and and got talked about Fylde. They're they're, they're going to be one of the better teams in the league. There, you know, they're going to get promoted, and that's sort of one that's sort of the train, if you like, the the Fylde train. You know, sort of um, I think was it the built. Was it built a new training ground, I think, and, and things like that. So the team were moving on. And then it goes to the complete opposite. Again, how how can you sort of explain that? Is it just one of those things that, you know, unlikely thing that happens, you know, it's the, the 5 or 10% where it just goes wrong. And sort of like I said, you get into a losing rut and, you know, that's in your head then, you lose him. Potentially, you know, you're potentially looking at a similar situation to, to the very thing, a team that's expected to do well you know, makes no mistake of, of letting everyone know what the expectations were. They, they, they tasted success, had a fantastic year, got beat in the playoff final, won the FA Trophy, you know, so a, a fantastic and a success. A club that's known nothing but success, been promoted, you know, however many times, six promotions or something, won the FA Trophy, won the FA Vars, you know, a manager that's been there for years, who's held in, a, like, you know, really high regard. Um you know, so yeah, went there expecting to do well. We signed a load of new players, so it was a, a massively new squad. Um, which, when I you know compare, was the same at Berry. Um, signed so many new players, it was an entirely new squad. Which everyone talks about time to gel and things like that is a thing. It, it doesn't just click. Sometimes you know, every now and again it might do, but it doesn't just click. Um, you know, started the season, you know, well enough over the sort of first four or five games and then just hit a rut. Um, and obviously it carried on, you know, throughout the season, getting in towards Christmas. Um, you know, Dave Chandler left, who'd been, you know, who was AFC filed. Everyone knows that. He was he was the manager. He was, he'd been here for years. Uh, he'd experienced all the success with them. So, you know, that was, that was a sad day for the club. And the manager that brought me here as well. So, you know, that, that wasn't great to see. Um, it's football. It happens, unfortunately. It happens with lads. It happens with managers. It's part and parcel of the game. Um, but, yeah, it, you know, it just didn't happen again in a, in a team that's... Exp- again, though, we, performances were there. Quality was there. Great. Probably the great, like, the best set of lads I've actually played with in terms of no egos, no big timers, no nothing like that. Everyone got on, no no little clicks or anything like that. Um it just it just didn't happen for us. Um we had chances when, when I mean when you look back at how the season ended, you know, there was games where we'd sort of drawn that we were winning or lost that we were drawing, and if we'd have just nicked a couple of those points, we'd have been we'd have been fine on the points per game that the way that it ended. Um but it's not gonna change now. What happened happened and we're trying to put it right this season. And at the end, obviously, so obviously, uh, for those perhaps watching in the future who um, you know don't remember this season or whatever, you should remember it. But perhaps even sort of some you know foreign fans who aren't too familiar, the season obviously got ended obviously because of uh, COVID and the government shutting things down. Um, one thing to note though, towards the end of that season, is there were two wins at the end. I've uh, got them here against Aldershot and Dagman Redbridge. Now, so we game still to play, and it would have been what would it would have been about six or seven games with it being so close had it ended as normal what do you think could have happened could the foul have stayed up I fully believe that we would have stayed up um, I thought it all the way that we'd eventually the results would have come 
uh, fully believed had the season continued, yeah, we would have stayed up. I think I think we had games in hand on on teams below us, on teams around us. Sorry, um, had we won the next game, I actually think our points per game would have would have rescued us. Do you know what I mean? Like, but it, it's the way it went. Like, say, I, I fully expected that we'd have stayed up. Like, come off the back of two wins, which we hadn't had for so long, we were eventually in a good place. You know, the people talk about the great escapes that teams have done over the years. That momentum and that confidence that it, that it instills was there. We were we were in a real good place. Um, so yeah, I think had the season continued as normal, we'd have been fine. Um, did I agree with concluding the season on a points per game basis? No, but nobody had ever experienced that before. It was completely uncharted waters. What other way was there? I don't know. Don't know what how you would have resolved it another way. Um, you know, there's probably a, there's a lot of teams looking at, you know, League One and League Two that, that suffered the same fate. They probably feel the way I do, slightly unjustified. Um, you, you know, to go down without even given a chance when other teams were given the opportunity to take your place, do I think was right? No. It is what it is. It happened. That's why, we, you know, we've worked so hard at trying to, trying to put it right this year. I guess also one sort of positive from that season, if you like, was was the FA Cup run. Um, you know, let me pull this up now. Um, so beating Peterborough Sports 6-1, Nantwich 1-0, Kingstonian 2-0, and then losing to Sheffield United. Um, again, for a bad season, a bit of a positive run and, and nice for the fans. Fantastic. Um, obviously, you know, even getting to the third round, I think it was the first time the club had done that, uh, which was fantastic in itself. But, that dream for the non-league clubs and the lower league clubs is to get that Premier League team and especially away as well um, is massive. Massive for the club financially, uh, massive for the lads experience-wise. Um, it was it was brilliant. Um, you know there was how many thousand there, which is nice. Probably the most we played in front of that year. Um, and we went close um, to go down two one. I've still not lived down missing a header from six yards past Dean Henderson, which would have been nice. Um, long-standing joke that we had our assistant manager last year, Kenny McKenna, used to say if I'd have scored that head, I would have gone on to win the FA Cup. But it would have uh, it would have been nice yeah, to, to have scored, to have got a result there, and even gotten back for a for a replay would have been lovely. But it wasn't to be. The lads, you know, did themselves proud. It was a good game, um, you know. So a, another historic moment for the club, really, um, getting into that third round against the Premier League club away. How many times will it happen? You never know. Then moving on to this season, like I said before, you want to try and do it right this season. Now, we don't know, um, we're recording this on the first, obviously, we don't know what's going to come out about how the season, if it's going to, it's going to be loans or grants or how it's going to end. So by the time you're watching, it may have come out, so it might be maybe a little bit out of date. But assuming, obviously, that you can finish the season in some kind of way and finish you know, playing games, what do you think, um, so, well, first of all, so far, how it's gone? And then second of all, if you can finish, what do you think uh, you know, teams looking to do? It's been a good start. Um, you know, we're I think we're 14 games in. Uh, we managed to get 14 games without having a, a COVID issue in the camp. Uh, so you know, we managed to go through nicely with no suspensions. Um, as a lot of teams, you know, sort of had to take 10 days here and 14 days there and things like that. We were fortunate enough to get through it. Um, a good start. We, we we've done well. We've dropped a couple of, of points that we shouldn't have done. Um, you know, which is unfortunate, but we're in a good place. Um, you know, I think we're third with games in hand. So we're in a good spot. Um, nothing to, to turn your nose up back there, um, especially, you know, with only a, you know, a third or just over a third of the, just under a third of the season gone. So, you know, we can't complain at that. Um, as you say, we don't know what's going to happen with the season. It's, uh, it's nerve wracking. It's frustrating. Um, yeah, I've got my opinions on it. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, I don't agree with everything that's going on. I don't agree with some of the statements that are coming out from from clubs. But it, again, it's it's sort of uncharted. Is it uncharted waters? I don't know because we went through it last year. Yeah. So not so sure that it is uncharted. But people seem to have their agendas this year now. So. You know, we'll see what comes out, really. 
I mean, it's, it's one of them, really. I mean, not to sort of come into sort of a National League politics, if you like, so much, but yeah, you can sort of say, all right, fair enough, last season, nobody predicted that this would happen. And, you know, it's not anybody knew it was going to happen. And last time anything like this would have happened would have been like World War Two or, you know, World War One or something like that. So, and those were cancelled after six games. So you can say, all right, fair enough, then nobody's seen this before. So you, just, you can sort of give them a pass then for last season and say, fair enough. You've got to yeah. think, though, there must have put, should have been some kind of plan to sort of say, okay, no sort of biases here going into next season. If you know, if it does, might might go and play the whole season and nobody hear of it ever again. But you've got to sort of be realistic and go. It could flare up again, and you know, if the government come along and say we're going to shut you down, what you're going to do then? Is it going to be points per game, and you're going to have some kind of round robin playoff system? What you're going to do? And that should have been set up from you know from day one. Is like okay, if we get to this many games, this is going to happen, and then there can no sort of no sort of um, biases if you like, you know. Because understandably, and this, I think this is fair enough, I think you know any sort of neutral would say this, understandably, teams are going to vote for whatever really is going to help them. That's fair. And I don't think anyone can really complain with that. You know, if you're down in the bottom, you're going to want to do what's ever best for you. I don't think people can really complain with that because clubs are out for the self-interest. So if you come up with some kind of neutral way of doing it, and then nobody can really complain You know, if it does come up then. But like I said, um, by the time you're watching this, uh, the answer may come out of what we're saying is a bit out of date, really. So, um, but yeah. Um, totally. I mean, like you say, teams have their own agendas. The teams at the top want to play on. The teams in the middle aren't bothered. Mm. The teams at the bottom want it cancelled. I think that was the same last year. We were probably in a similar spot last year where we didn't think it should have ended one way. It did. But how important is precedent? You know, it's been set now. Last year, we went down on the basis that the playoffs in the league below were allowed to continue and they were given the chance to take our spot. Now, this year, if they cancel the season, if they just cancel it, we've ended up going down and then not given the chance to do the exact same thing less than 12 months later. Yeah. Obviously, I have my own agenda. You know, I want to go up at the end of the day. But how, you know, Less than 12 months apart, you're looking at two totally different outcomes based on what, you know, I'm hearing a lot of teams, you know, obviously this funding, the funding is an issue. Of course it is, teams need the money. I'm not arguing with that. What I am seeing is certain teams saying they want funding for the, not just to continue playing, but to provide testing. How many teams were using the first batch of funding for testing? from September to December. I'd be surprised if any were testing the players, if not just sending them for NHS tests. Hmm. So I'm not sure that's a valid argument. I agree that testing should be in place, but it wasn't required for the first three months of the season. And now all of a sudden we're looking at, you know, null and void and all promotions and relegations. It's becoming a, a prevalent issue. You know, um, again, I don't know the science behind it. I don't know the figures behind it. I don't know the finance side of it. But it, it seems that a lot of you know a lot of teams' agendas are coming out into the public view, and and you can see it a mile off. Mm. I would just quickly, um, and I think what you said there about twelve months apart having two different sort of precedent. I think that's definitely true. I mean, looking and again, teams have played different number of games, but I'm looking at the league table now for for this season. And the, most teams have played between 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So about, let's say, an average of 15. You then look at last season when it was cancelled, the average was 28, yeah. 29, 30. So if we say that we're about halfway to where we are last season, if we get to that 30-game mark, you've got to have the same. There's no argument then. What what point yeah, do you yeah. say? Do you say 20 games, 20? I don't know. But definitely, yeah. if you get to that 30-game point, you've got to do the same outcome. It's a massive It's a massive thing to say. We've not played anywhere near the same amount of games we played last year. Not arguing with that either. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a totally relevant point. Um, like you say, we haven't played anywhere near the same amount of games. Um, you know, what? but what's the answer? If we're, if we're in a, a do-or-die situation now, whether it's play on or null and void or what, then I, like I say, I, I just don't see... I don't see how you can even, it's regardless. I mean, we hadn't played the same amount of games as teams last year. This year, we still not played the same amount of games as teams this year. So that's that's similar. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the same situation as well, though, we're seeing, you know, a part of the same system, the same, um, put them under the same tent, if you will, the National League and the National League North and South. I'm seeing there's potentially two different votes. But it's the same 
it's the same bracket. How can you have two different votes for what is essentially the same same league? Mm. You know, divisions are different, of course they are, but and the standards higher, but there's a lot up in the air that hasn't been answered and doesn't look like it's going to get answered. What it looks like is it's just gonna happen and that's 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 how it's dealt with, which is what happened last year, it was a case of right, this is it. There's there's no arguing. Um but I just I don't I don't I, no I don't think anybody does. I think mm. everybody's the same, like humming and harvard, nobody really knows what's fair, what's not fair, what's legal, what's not legal. Yeah. What's it, it's completely random, like I say. I, I have my opinion, which is precedent's been set. We went down on the basis that somebody was given the chance to take our place. We should be given that same opportunity, I think. Um, will it happen again? I don't know. But with my sensible head on, are we in a place to argue? Mm. Probably not. Everyone you know, watching in might be thinking, oh, grand scheme of things, it's not that big a deal. Obviously, the health of the nation and things like that are much more important, which they are. Um, but I'm biased. This is my job. It's my livelihood. I want the best things from it. So... I'd like to be given that opportunity. I think that's fair enough as well. As obviously, while obviously there are other things going on, it's the job of the players, the clubs, the leagues, the fans. That's their sort of thing, you know. And there'll be other, lots of other industries where they've got to sort out themselves, really, you know, and, and come up with some kind of plan to, you know, keep going on. And, and it's also the football as well has been treated a bit differently in terms of, you know, not everyone, but some other businesses or you know things have been bailed out or whatever. And football was sort of said, well, you know, you've got to bail. Premier League were told to bail out, you know, low leagues. So football was in general treated a bit differently. And it, again, it's one of them, where do you draw a like this whole elite sport where you can say, okay, Premier League, they're elite, but then you go down Championship, League One, League Two, National, where do you draw the line? Because it's not as quite, it's not as simple as that to draw it at Football League. Because most people would say now, and we've had guys on who would say National League, that's essentially League Three. Now that is, you know, that's very close to League Two. And that, you know, the only difference is that you don't legally, within the rules, don't have to be a professional team to be in there. You know, uh, the, the actual quality is very much the same. So when you say National League, it's, it's a difficult thing. And I think you, what you said there, fair enough, right? Last season, we could sort of say that, that, that nobody saw it coming. So a wrong decision, you could say, OK, fair enough. But for this season, you've got to have had something in place, sure, to sort of say, well, if it does flare back up, then what we're going to do? But I mean, well, I think you, you could... You think so? I mean... Like you talk about the elite status there, so this is also a different a difficult issue. I mean, you know, everyone says how is the north and south issue? Majority teams are part time, lads have jobs. How is it elite football? Well, the elite status was fought for last year by teams in this league who wanted to go up, and that was the only way they were going to continue was to be declared as elite status. Now, there's teams in the national league that aren't full time. There's teams in the north and south that are. So there's a big mix of. You know, you, you could say, right, to be elite, you've got to be full-time. Right, well, that nullifies the majority of the North and South and a couple of teams from the National League. Not fair. Mm. So I don't see it. I don't know what the fair outcome is. But I, I go back to precedent. The North and South were declared elite football. It should remain that way. You can't just change it now because some teams can't afford to continue or, or some teams don't want to continue. It was declared elite. You can't just take it away nine months later. <laughs> like it's again, you might be able to. I'm being harsh. I don't know, but again, you're looking at less than twelve months apart. Two potentially, you know, completely different decisions that you know can decide the outcome of not only teams' future but lads' contracts and livelihoods as well. Like I say, if this season gets finished. I've potentially lost two years of my footballing career. Mm. at 25, 26, that's hard to come back from. You know, if teams aren't offering contracts, teams don't want to offer contracts because they don't know guarantees of lads, of fans coming back in, of any guaranteed income for the club. You know, it's all right at the top, but at the bottom, you know, you are playing with lads' lads' livelihoods. Mm. I think we could be able to do a whole sort of two-hour podcast and everything that's gone on with the rules oh. and stuff like that. But, the, you know, really what you said, the important thing is really as well is that to, to paint, and especially for anyone who isn't massively familiar, that you might think, oh, these are footballers on lots of money. Yeah, listen, maybe at top level, and you could tell them to sort of, it's fair enough, you can shut up. But, you know, really at this level, 
it is the type of thing where you're going to have players who let go and they're going to have to, right, I've got to be a normal guy. You've got to be a normal guy and get a normal job just like everyone else. And of course, it's a privilege that you are that, you know, less than 1% who do go on and even get anywhere close to the professional level, even if you only have a little sniff of it. But, you were the, you know, wages-wise, the further you go down, you know, we've seen clubs like, uh, you know, uh, what they're called, um, I forgot the name, uh, Droylston, sorry, who they've had to completely shut down you know, and the entire season. Um, at the start of the season, they said, yeah, we can't enter the team this season. So lots of guys are going to be losing out money. And yeah, it's their jobs. It's, you know, it's a side income. And, it, you know, footballers aren't, low league footballers, sorry, aren't the only ones who are losing out on money. It's, you know, I think that's something they have in common with a lot of other people who just financial, they screwed over really. So, um, <laughs> yeah, like I said, we could do a whole two-hour podcast on it. And maybe we'll re- revisit it in a year, 18 months once people are allowed to talk about what they're allowed to talk about. And then we could sort of, you know, speak about it more maybe. I think that's something we'll see in a few years, people coming out and sort of saying, this went wrong, you know, whatever. But um, moving on to some more um, less sort of serious questions, if you like, as we always yeah. do. Um, best player you've played with on your team? On my team? Um it's a tough one. I've played with a lot of good lads. Um, you know, if, if I think, you know, in terms of level, uh, I was I played with Aaron Ramsdale at Chesterfield, who's now an established Premier League goalkeeper. Which you know, you might people might think, oh, you're thinking of a striker or a, you know, a number ten or a winger or something like that. But he, you could see then that he had the ability to go on and do so. Um, I've been fortunate enough to play in some. Uh, pre-season games and 23s games with the first team at Burnley I played you know Joey Barton was phenomenal Jack Cork Ben Mee lads that there is seriously levels to this game and you don't notice it until you play with them you know you might see them on TV and think oh that was easy or I could do that but until you play with them you've just got no idea um, so yeah I'd put somebody like that up there um, Stephen Defoe I saw him, Danny Ings, in a couple of games was just, just le- there's just levels to the game. And like I say, you don't appreciate until you play with them how good they actually are and they are where they are for a reason. They don't, they don't do the things they do because they get paid what they get paid. They get paid because they do what they do. Like it, it's not, it's not the other way around. Like they get paid because they are that good. Um, best stadium you've played in? Easy. Um, fortunate enough to play at Old Trafford and the Etihad within a couple of weeks of each other in the Youth Cup um, at 16 and 17. Hard to top either one of them. You know, I'd like to get to Wembley one day. It hasn't happened yet, but until then, um, you know, the Old, Tra- Old Trafford at, at 16 and the Etihad at 17 is hard to beat. Sort of touched on this before, but a um, few videos we saw of like tough tackles and sort of like I said, a few red cards. I think one of them I saw was when you were at Gateshead and within the first 10 seconds you went in, slid in. Um, what's that all about? We sort of touched on it before, but why are you, is that the type of guy you are just sort of wanting to put put your just, stamp out there and say, you know, I'm here, you know, you, you well, know I'm going to get you? There's a couple of reasons. I mean, I absolutely loathe the way that lads go down now when they get hit, like, you know, if they, if they get hit in a tackle or the flailing arm hits somebody now and they roll around. I, I can't stand it. Like, I think it's embarrassing. It's pathetic. Like, you're a grown man. Like, I'd hate to see you get punched because <laughs> it'd be pathetic. But I don't know. I was taught from a young age, if you go into a 50-50, you go in full-blooded. Otherwise, you're going to end up getting hurt. If you pull out, you are more likely to get hurt. And also... It's just competitive nature. The ball's there to be won. I want to win it. And I and if I do get hurt, I don't want to let the other guy know that I've been hurt. You know, it's an ego thing. I would rather go in with everything I've got than pull out and let him think he's got one over on me. Um, so, yeah, I, I pulled out a tackle once when I was 15. And I remember my, my managers, who I'm still in touch with now, looked at me and said, if you pull out another tackle, you will not play. And I just, that was it. I just, I've never, I've always been the same since I was literally 16. Now, anybody who's I've ever played with knows that if there's a 50 50 there, then I will be going in for it. Um, it's just, it's just a habit now. Don't think twice. Um, if I go in, I'm going, I don't go in to hurt people. That's not my game. Mm. I go in to win the ball fairly. 
Um, you know, but if there's a ball there to be won, then I'll be going for it. A uh, moment where you thought, what am I doing here? This is a bit of a crazy moment. It was something that you wouldn't have expected you know, to be involved with as a footballer. It's something so sort of so different and, and unexpected. Um, oh, tough one. Um, I think that win at Rotherham uh, at Morecambe was, was up there. First time I'd ever played against a team that high. Um, that was up there. You know, to be to knock a championship team out was pretty special. Um, even even going back like beyond that, my, my league debut, my league debut was was pretty special. We got beat on the day, but it's something you know you just never thought would happen. It, it was a big deal to make your league debut. You, you have to be doing well to be playing. Um, you know, and to start to start the game as well was was pretty special. Um, I've not had too many sort of what are called sparkling nights in my career mm. really where. Any anything magical's really happened, but uh, well, actually, the the one the one game was scoring the winner at all the shot last year. Um, we haven't won for a few for a good few weeks, um, you know, and to to notch that one in the ninety fourth was was pretty special. Um, it was the start of of the revive, um, and and that was a good night. I enjoyed that. Um, funniest moment of your career that you're allowed to speak of, obviously, which I understand. I understand, obviously, like there's going to be a few funny things you're not going to be allowed to say because you're still with players and stuff like that. But of what you're allowed to say, funniest moment. I've got one in my head, but I'm not so sure that I'll be allowed to. Uh, I'll be allowed to put that out there yet. Um, Give it a few years, then, then you can. <laughs> I'd like to put it out there. I mean, go on. I'll, uh, so there's a there's a game known among footballers that. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with called the pound coin game. Um, so you start a game of football and somebody has a pound coin on them in the sock or the sleeve and they're under armour. Um, and the aim of the game is to not get caught with the pound coin at the end of the game. So as the game goes on, you pass the pound coin on to somebody else. And they have to hold. You can't refuse the pound coin. You have to hold the pound coin. Uh, and, and pass it on as best you can without ever getting caught and whoever ends up with the pound coin at the end of the game has to do a forfeit we played it last game of the season loser had to buy all the beers for the lads on the bus um, so yeah let, you know fans will be watching the game completely unaware that you know we're, we're playing the pound coin game down the pitch um, that, that, that was quite enjoyable um, you know just as a as a bit of a joke and a bit of fun. Obviously, you wouldn't do it if there was something on the game. Of course not. But as the season peters out, you know, it's a bit of fun. And uh, you get towards end of season dues and things like that. That was um, that was quite a funny game when you've got lads trying to trying to put the, the pound coin down the sock and in the goalie gloves and things like that at set pieces. So that's quite enjoyable. But it's only happened once, um, you know. So for anybody who doesn't know, that mm. happens. I think fans now will be going back looking at highlights that you're involved with, trying to see, can I see you near him, doing anything like that. I think, you know, I've heard of a few games, not a few games, a few sort of stories of similar stuff like that, where it's like, uh, especially like uh, you were on like, uh, like Gaza, you know, World Cup 90s, some of the stuff that he was involved with, you know, and it's not as bad as that. So some of the stuff I've heard is pretty disgusting. And, you know, pretty, we had one a lot of, few days, ago, a few weeks ago where it was like, that's disgusting. So not the worst one. There's a lot of stuff that goes on, um, and unless you're in, unless you're in in the mm. game, you don't know about it, and mm. you would never actually think that it happens. But it does. Footy's a brotherhood, um, you know. Some of the stuff that goes on, and, and as you, if anybody listens to you know podcasts of lads playing through the '90s and early 2000s of the nights out and in you know, the things they used to get up to, the games changed now. You, you don't get away with it as much. Um, mm. You know, it's a lot more professional, a lot more serious, but. If you ever listen to, to you know some of those stories, the way that the game was, it, it's just fantastic. I, you know, I, I wish it was ever so slightly still like that, but it's evolved. It's, you know, it's the nature of the game, and a lot of stuff does go on that people don't know about, people don't think would ever happen in any professional walk of life, but it uh, it manages to find its way in there. I guess you can't get away with it though because of social media and everyone's got an iPhone. So if you see something. You're filmed, and then you know you're getting you know punishment or something like that. You know, compared to compared to back 20, 30 years ago, the only people who had cameras were professional photographers, which yeah. you know now now anyone well we've seen it past few days of you know anyone can make it in the news by complaining over some something you know 
if a snowman's been kicked over your headline news. So professional football doing something's going to be, you know, exactly. yeah. So time, times have changed, and, and the game's adapted with it as well. You know, the lads are professional. You know, it's you know it's not like things happening every day. You know, there's the funny stories come out and things like that. But you know, the lads are professional. They're you know super athletes now. You know, the lads aren't going out on the the Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sunday clubs that they used to back in the day. But you know, it, you know, it, it did used to happen. Um, and for anyone who doesn't or hasn't listened to it, I would encourage them to to listen to it, you know what the game was like as they were growing up. Mm. I think we had um, more sort of funny stories. He, well, he's, he's still playing, but he went from like the nineties or whatever. But Joe Byron, we've had on it. Some of the, he told a few stories of like some of the stuff. You know, um, you know, one was like Chris Wilder um, that they were on a bar, not as crazy as perhaps some of the stuff I've heard from, but it um, at Northampton at the time were on a bad run, losing and stuff. Like Actually, just said right, every, lads in the bar in the hotel said, if you don't have a drink, you're not playing in the next game. So then, you know, everyone got had a drink and then they went and played and won the next game. So, you know, stuff like that is a bit sort of, you wouldn't have heard of and it comes out a few years later. So sort of, well, that's why we, you know, we beat Tramway or whatever. And, you know, so, and it's quite interesting as well. You get the sort of the professional image that they're all these sort of polished guys and you hear some of the stuff and it's like, I had no idea he was doing stuff like that. And as an outsider, like I said, I'm a fan. I, I hear that some of that, some of that stuff sometimes and you think, oh, you know, it's, it's not as nice as um, it appears to be. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean the, the the camaraderie and you know the the, the ba- you know the banter and things like that is a massive part of success in a changing room. Like you've got a, a team that gets on um, with each other, you know, off the field, and more than likely or not, they're going to succeed on the field. And I think you know that was a massive part, you know, especially in the olden days, was when lads were spending so much time together because they were out on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Friday, you know, a Saturday and a Sunday, like. They, they understood everything about each other. They knew exactly what everyone was like and it, and it played a massive part on the field. Now it's not so, you know, it doesn't happen as much. Um, you know, there's a lot, well, specifically now, obviously in these COVID times when you, you're getting up to training, you're training, you get off, you spend no time off the field. You know, it, it's hard to, to build that that relationship. But, you know, especially, you know, going back over the years, then people will be surprised how, how good a night out does for, for team morale. Um advice you would give to young players coming into the game, advice for sort of, you know, trying to get into professional football if you're in an academy or something like that? Um, you're, never, you're never too good for anything. So those, you know, if you are 23 and you're still playing in the 23s and you believe you should be playing higher or you're 18 and you're playing in the 18s and you believe you should be playing higher, you have to make it as difficult as you can for yourself in order to succeed at the higher level. So, if an 18s game is easy for you, make it as difficult as you can by, you know, guaranteeing your positioning's right, your passing's right, your, your heading's right, your communication's right, your attitude's right, everything like that, you know, to to stand yourself instead for when you go up the level, you know, you you, you can you can cope. Um, you know, you see you see loads of lads or senior pros that you know have to play in the 23s and they bomb it off and they don't run around and things like that. Like you can get something out of everything you do, um, whether that's a, a training session, a, a gym session, running session, anything like that. Like you can get something out of it um, and it will benefit you going forward. So it's so anything you do, do it properly um, and you can, you can rely on it later down the line. I think you saw, touched on this before um, with Markham, but if you could change one result from your career, and see where, uh, say, change one moment from your career, sorry, see where that sort of alternate timeline would have gone, what would have happened for, for the good or bad. Uh, what moment would you change and why? Um, I mean, I, I could pick a few, really, a couple of results that I would change, but I think, like I said, I, I've always said that I'd like to have gone back to Morton for that second year. Um, I say I'd done well. Um, I knew the place, I knew the manager, I knew the lads. Um and I'd like to have gone back and had another crack at it second year um, to see if we could have done anything or even how I would have got on just personally doing two years at League Two before trying to make the jump. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to have gone, you know, gone back there and, and seeing what would have changed. Um, would I have ended up at Chesterfield in the January? Would I have, you know, ended up at Grimsby the year after that? I don't know. Would I have left Burnley? I don't know. Um, you know, you, you can never tell. It's not to say that I look back on it with, with deep regret. You know, it's something I would like to change. I certainly, you know, I certainly don't want to say regret what I did because um, it's all part of the experience. But, 
yeah, I would I would have liked to have to have had another crack at that. Do you think that's something what talks about what I said before that now National League is almost like League Three and there is League One, League Two and National League so close in quality that those fine moments is the difference between you, you know, a player perhaps going on and being a League One type of guy compared to being a National League type of guy. Do you think that's what it is now because it's that close? Massively, yeah. Um, there's a lot of lads playing non-league that could easily be playing in the league and all the way around. Um, you know, it's getting better every year and it's getting harder and harder to stay at the level. Um, people used to think conference was just, you know, it was your pub guys who, you know, would just launch it and, you know, battle of the back four, so to speak. But it's changing now. Um, you can see that in the FA Cup runs now, the amount of non-league teams that are, that are getting on. Um causing upsets, not just non-league, you know, you're talking League Two as well against, against the top boys. But yeah, the gap's not not as big as what it used to be. Um, like you said, there's a lot of lads that could quite easily make the jump um, and will do quite comfortably. Um, and especially now as well, teams think, you know, te- teams can get lads from non-league relatively cheap. They don't have to pay big transfer fees. They don't have to pay big wages. They can, they can nick lads out of non-league. And there's so much talent there Lads that either haven't had quite had the break, have come through non-league systems, haven't been at, at top clubs and dropped down. They've they've come through 16s, 18s, pub teams to to get to where they are. So the ability's there, the talent's there, um, and it's starting to get realised. Like you say, you see a lot of lads coming out of there now and, and getting into the league and and becoming stars essentially. So you know it's 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 getting looked at in a higher esteem than what it has done over the last uh, five to ten years. What do you think the future holds for you then? Sort of short term, obviously, you said you want to get promoted. We've filed, obviously. But long term, if you could have a look, end of your career, look back and sort of say, yeah, I'm happy with that. I'm, I'm happy. I sort of, I say, I have to take that. That's a decent career. What would you sort of, you know, look back on it and what would you sort of want it to do? Well, I mean, obviously, like you said, you summed up there, short term would, would like to be promotion back to the National League of Filed. Um, I like it. Yeah, I like this part of the country. I'm settled with my partner. You know, you know, life's, life's pretty good, um, or as good as it can be given the circumstances. Um, you know, I'd like to get back in the league. You know, I, I make no no qualms about about saying that. Whether that's with filed, whether that's moving on, regard on years to come, I, I don't know. I don't know how it'll work. I don't know how it'll happen. I don't know what the circumstances will be surrounding it. But I'd like to get back into the league. Um, you know. <sighs> I'm not one of them who says, "Oh, I need to make 200 appearances to to class myself as a success." You know, I'm I'm quite happy that I've managed to to play in the league. Like, you know, not a lot of people will get the chance to do so. I think I'm on about 90 or nine, you know, might be on about 90 appearances in the league. I'd like to get 100 short, you know, as soon as I can, and and, and you know, and kick that number on. Um, but yeah, I, I I'll just be happy if, as long as I can play football. You know. I'll be happy as long as full, uh, football is a, is a full-time job for me. I'll, I'll consider myself quite happy. Um, like I say I'm not, I'm not overconfident or big-headed or anything like that. I don't think oh, I need to be playing at League Two or League One or Championship level or anything like that to be a success. I just I like playing football regardless of what level it is. Um, you know, like I say, I, I would like to get back to the league, but you know, some of it's not. You know, I can. You know, it is in my control to a certain extent, but. Whether the circumstances allow it, you know, we'll never know. Um, especially where the game's going at the minute, it, it, you know, it might be tough. Um, but who knows? Um, anything can happen. You know, it can, football can change like that one way or the other. You can, you can shoot to the top, or you can, you know, you can fall right down. So, as you know, there's there's um, there's case studies of that happening every single year. So, you know, I, I'll do what I can. But as long as I'm in football, I consider myself a success. Uh, have you ever, ever had a thought of like, as you're still young, you're not, you're not old, but sort of post playing about what you might be doing? Is it coaching? Is it something to do with perhaps media? We've seen, you know, media, you know, with some of the, especially some low league guys doing media stuff. Have you ever thought of that or are you just sort of thinking, focus on playing career and think about that no, later? So I'm, I'm quite keen on the idea of coaching. Um, I've looked into that. I'm, I'm, well, I was going to start my UEFA B uh, last year, but. It, uh, you know, I got cut short um, pretty mm. quickly. So that's something I've done. You know, I've got a little bit of experience coaching um, under 16s teams and things like that, just locally. Um, 
so yes, yeah, looked into that. Um, that's definitely something I'll be I'll be pursuing as as the years go on, getting getting you know my badges and getting qualified. Um, but yeah, I've looked at I've looked at you know sort of alternative careers. Um, I'm more so now than than any any other time really. It's becoming more and more um, important. Um, like I say, that there's only so far you can go down before you do have to get a job. Mm. Uh, and you know, nobody knows how soon that might be. So, yeah, I'm potentially looking at, at learning something. Um, I, you know, I've got qualifications in certain areas. Um, you know, but I'd be looking to, you know, to find something a bit more permanent, really, um, and something I'll be looking at very, very intensely over the next twelve months. As well, and um, lots of fans will be watching this of your ex teams, just fans in general. But I think most of the guys watching will be able to be filed. Foul fans, um, what message would you give to foul fans watching this? Um, you know, like I said, for this season and you know, obviously years to come with filed. Um, st- stick with us, man. It's um, you know, obviously last year was was a big blow, um, but the ambition of the club, the chairman, the manager, and the, and the lads is is to be shooting back up. Um, you know, as soon as we can, whether that's this year, whether it's not, regardless, you know, depending on what happens. Um, but there's a good, the, the club's in a good place um, with the lads they've got, with the staff they've got, the ambition, you know, the foresight, it, it's there. Um, and like I say, it, it's going to happen at some point, whether it happens, you know, sooner rather than later is, is unbeknown. But it's, um, you know, Obviously, we'd love to get the fans back in the stadium as soon as we can. I think everybody, you know, feels that way. Everybody prefers playing with fans rather than without. Adds a totally different uh, dynamic to the game. Um, you know, so stay patient. Um, hopefully, we can we can get them in. Um, but in the meantime, you know, you know, I think the the streaming service that that most clubs have been able to provide has been a, a lifesaver. Um, you know, five, six, seven, eight quid a match, with whatever it is, is. It's as good as it's going to get, um, meaning they can still watch live footy. Um, so yeah, st- stick with it. Um, we'll get there eventually, um, and hopefully, like I say, in the meantime, we can keep the results coming. You know, while while they have to stay away, and then, and when they come back in, we c- we can kick on massively with their help. Yeah, I want to say thanks, thanks for you for taking your time. Out. I think it's probably one, probably one of the longest ones we've done. Are probably looking at just under sort of two hours. Maybe, maybe get edit, edited down a bit. I think cutting off the the start, uh, just setting everything up. Uh, but yeah, thanks for you for for coming on and taking time out. We do obviously appreciate it, and anyone taking time out and having a chat, you know, and sort of telling, said, told a few stories, and like I said, insight into you know what it is as, as your job, and and you know, and I think it's interesting not only for fans, obviously, file fans. I said we'll be watching this probably the main one, but also people in general to sort of get an understanding of what it is you do and how it works and and sort of some of the behind the scenes that you wouldn't have wouldn't have seen especially during these times when there might be a few assumptions going around about you know what, what it's like and stuff like that so yeah um quickly before we go um just want to shout out to everyone who's who's uh, watching this um we've got some other ones so link in the description for all the other ones we've done we've had guys who've played obviously national league that's the whole point of this but you know guys who've played league one league two and sort of national league north and south so it's quite a lot a lot of different stories um, is there anything else you want to say before uh, we go? Or... Um, no, mate, uh, we've sort of we've sort of covered it. Um, you know, obviously, I think we're all hoping that we can get back to normal as soon as we can. Hope, hoping that you know the league can continue. Um, you know, at my level anyway. Um, you know, so fingers crossed that you know we can get back to normal as soon and get people back in the stands and uh, you know and get football back to what we all know it um, as being. So. Fingers crossed, um, you know, we'll get there eventually, but the sooner the better, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, thanks for everybody to watch. Be sure to subscribe to the channel below. As you can see, help us get a bit few more subs. It'll help us. And obviously, like the video and stuff like that. And like I said, I always say, I need to keep saying this for every single one, but the more support you give, the more more we'll do from your team, hopefully, if we can get them on, obviously. So, you're a foul fan and you want more foul interviews, give it a share and, and we'll try and get some more hopefully. We can try. We'll try our best. Uh, but yeah, thanks for watching and we'll, we'll see you in the next episode.